Well, welcome to the 24th Darwin College Lecture Series. And it won't have escaped your attention that this year is 2009, which is the bicentenary of the birth of Charles Darwin, and the 150th anniversary of the publication of On the Origin of Species. So we had no choice. The subject had to be, uh, had to be Darwin. So in the coming eight lectures, our speakers will be exploring Charles Darwin's intellectual achievement and, and its legacy. Um, I have to admit to being a, as excited as a 12-year-old about this, and it's partly that the subject is so interestingly coherent and just intrinsically fascinating. Um, it's partly because I have to admit that Andy Fabian and myself have organized a series this year, unlike usual, we usually get other people to do that. Um, uh, but it's also because the quality of the speakers we've been able to get. We consulted very widely as to who might be the most appropriate people to talk about different topics. And, um, and we got all our first choices. Um, and I think the, uh, the secret is if you ask people far enough in advance, they can't think of a reason to say no. <laughs> um, and in the next few weeks, the lectures will explore the origins of Darwin's ideas. Um, their impact on literature, on society, and on um, social thought. And then we'll move to consider the implications for biodiversity, for human development, and for the scientific understanding of evolution more generally. But tonight, we're starting with the, what you could consider as the cutting edge of where the science thinking that Darwin set in motion has got to today. And we're very lucky to have um, Professor Sean Carroll from the University of Wisconsin to speak on the making of the fittest. Now, Professor Carroll was educated at Washington University, St. Louis. Um, he did his doctoral research in uh, immunology at Tufts University in Boston and went on to Boulder, Colorado before moving to uh, Wisconsin. He worked primarily on fruit flies and butterflies, and he came to focus on the, uh, the genetic basis of morphological change in living things. In particular, he's been able to identify the, um, the genetic switches in, in, in of evolution, um, which, as an economist, I would probably get wrong by saying, what triggers genetically transmissible mutations? Um, Professor Carroll's also, in recent years, become a, a uh, popular advocate of Darwin's theory. He's written a number of books, three since 2004, for the general reader. Um, uh, one came out, uh, or is coming out shortly, I think, or perhaps came out last week, called Remarkable Creatures, which is about Darwin and, and, and other people who explored these things. Um, and one came out last year, um, which has the title of his talk, um, The Making of the Fittest. It's a privilege to introduce Professor Carroll. Well, good evening. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Brown, for the very kind introduction, and thanks to the Cambridge University community for inviting me. Wow. <laughs> 2009, here I am, the anniversary of Darwin's birth and the 150th anniversary of the origin of species. Pinch me. Um, I think I could tell, but that's a series a little more familiar to you than to my American audiences. And this is the first time I haven't had to worry about you understanding the accents. Um, I, I think I could hear you enjoyed those short excerpts from Nick Park's brilliant Creature Comfort series. Um, those animals lays, raise a lot of questions about evolution, about how new capabilities evolve, and about genes and genomes. And my pleasure tonight is to update you on some of the remarkable progress that's being made in understanding how evolution works, how the fittest are made. And to do so, I'm going to talk about some strange and wonderful, and I, from here on out, I promise, uh, entirely real creatures. And the first, and I think the most amazing animal I know about, um, requires us to go back in time to a voyage a long time ago not that voyage, different voyage. The voyage of the SS Norvegia in 1928 in the Southern Ocean. 
Now, as the, as the whaling stocks in the North Atlantic were depleted, whaling nations looked for um, quarry in the Southern Ocean. And so the Norwegian government was concerned that its fleet would be prosperous, and it sent out the Norvegia with really three missions. The first mission was to establish a shelter for either distressed, uh, ships in distress or, or shipwrecked sailors. Now you can tell from this picture that these waters are pretty rough. You can see all the ice in the water around the Norvegia, and so there were a lot of hazards to navigation. And so they wanted some place where they could stash a, uh, some provisions in case um, some sailors needed a, a safety, a, a haven. And so they were headed for what may be one of the most remote places on the planet, this island, Bouvet Island. Now, this is a picture taken, in fact, as the Norvegia approached the island by a young zoologist on board named Ditlif Rustad. And it was the practice in the Norwegian fleet to send along zoology students uh, on these either research vessels or on the whaling ships themselves to do a little marine biology, to understand the food web in the oceans, to understand the population of uh, animals that might be of interest to them, whether that's krill, for example, or whales or seals, et cetera. So the mission was to establish a, a shelter here on Bouvet and also, Norway wanted to claim Bouvet for the Norwegian government. Now, as it turns out, um, Britain had already done so. <laughs> but we'll get to that part in a second. Now, I said this is a remote place. So what am I talking about remote? Well, let's look at Bouvet on the map. Here it is. I think far from anywhere would be a good description. Of course, maybe the more familiar place is South Georgia Island, the island to which Shackleton rode to, to save the crew of the Endurance in 1916. But in terms of any place of refuge in this part of the ocean, Bouvet was it. Now, as you can tell, it's a pretty hostile looking place. It's ice covered. Uh, the waters are very cold surrounding it. It's just a, an imposing rock sticking up um, out of the ocean. But nonetheless, it was the only place where they could, go, they could head. So in fact, in late uh, 1928, the ship made it there, and the crew claimed Bouvet Island for Norway. And this is a little crew um, portrait with, just for example, at the far left, there's Ditlif Rusted. So they're making this claim. And as I understand it, it was a relatively short tussle with Britain about who would own Bouvet. I think uh, Great Britain decided <laughs> they could have it. Um, and uh, there, are, there are still to this day uh, no condos or anything like that on Bouvet Island, though. although I imagine Last year, there were probably some American banks willing to lend the money. Um, so their first mission of claiming and of establishing at least some sort of refuge on, on uh, Bouvet was, was successful. But there was another mission, which was research. And that's why Detlef Rusted was on, was on board. And so once they had uh, established a bit of a, of a routine, the uh, Norwegia would, would sort of patrol the island, they'd get into smaller boats, and what Ditlif would do is he'd take a net and just toss it over the edge and just trawl up, see what he could find. And one day, he found a really peculiar looking fish. Now this fish, it turns out, some of the old hands on board had seen this fish before, and they had dubbed it the ice fish because of its really white, translucent appearance. Pretty strange looking fish, I think you'd agree, with a really protruding jaw full of teeth. It's a, clearly a predator. Um, but you can see this almost translucent skin. Now, Detlef was curious. This was his job as a, as a zoologist. And so he brought the fish on, onto the deck, and he did what any good Norwegian would do. He filleted it. And he was in for a big shock. Because when he opened up this fish, unlike any other fish he had filleted, he saw that its blood was quite peculiar. Now I'm going to show you a modern photograph in the next picture of what ice fish blood looks like on the right. Completely colorless. Whereas many other fish in the Southern Ocean and everywhere else in the world have red blood, like you and I. Well, this was pretty peculiar. Detlef made note of it. He took some pictures of the fish splayed open on the deck, but there was a long time to go on the voyage, 
and there were many more islands to visit, and he completed his tour and went back to Norway. Another zoologist, a couple years later, Johan Rood, went out on a similar voyage on a whaling ship, and the hands on that ship told him about this bloodless ice fish. And he said, oh, this is nonsense, bloodless ice fish. I'm a zoology student. I know that every animal with a backbone, every vertebrate, has red blood cells. That's how the oxygen is carried in their bodies. And so he just thought this was all a myth, that he was just being teased. And when he finished his voyage, he was back in Norway, and he happened to talk to Detlef Rusted, and he said, ah, you know, I heard this legend of the bloodless ice fish. And Detlef said, I've seen such a fish. Johan Rood was really taken aback. Have you seen such a fish? He said, yeah, I've had the photographs. And from that moment, Johan Rood just could not get this fish out of his mind. He'd, he'd missed the chance to see it, evidently, on his long voyage. And he kept asking as more and more people went to the Southern Ocean and came back, did you see any of these fish? Did you see any of these fish? And finally, 25 years after his original voyage, he decided, I'm going to find out for myself. He was already a senior scientist, um, well recognized for his expertise. He went back to the Southern Ocean, set up a makeshift laboratory on, the, on South Georgia Island, and got a few specimens of ice fish, live specimens. And he was able to investigate their blood, to measure the levels of oxygen in it, oxygen in it and look at it. And he confirmed still much to his surprise and the surprise of the biological community when he reported his findings, that there's not a single red blood cell in these fish. So these are the only vertebrates known without red blood cells. And there's about 15 species of ice fish. Now, why would that be so stunning? Well, if you were to take this centrifuge tube and spin it down in a centrifuge, it turns out only about 1% of the blood is cellular by volume, and all those cells are white, involved with host defense. The rest would be a relatively clear plasma. Now contrast that with some other fish in the ocean, like such as this red-blooded fish, about 15 to 18 percent of its cell volume is red blood cells. And in you and I, about 45 percent of our blood volume is red blood cells, and anything less than that we call anemia, and anything significantly less than that is life-threatening. So how can these fish get by with no red blood cells at all, completely different than all the other fish in the ocean and all the other animals with a backbone? Well, Rude measured the oxygen levels in their blood. It was the same level as the oxygen in the surrounding ocean waters. And he noticed, well, they were, they were a little peculiar. They had much larger hearts than other fish of the same body size. They had really enlarged capillaries. They were virtually uh, scaleless. So, Clearly, they were just passively absorbing oxygen and pumping around larger volumes of blood with this larger heart, but no enrichment of, that, of the oxygen in that blood with, by red blood cells. Now, he immediately recognized that this very peculiar aspect of physiology in these fish must be somehow linked to their extreme environment. Now, that environment is they live in waters about 29 degrees Fahrenheit, so three degrees below the freezing temperature of, of fresh water. And he figured, well, maybe this is just a way of reducing the viscosity of, of body fluids at low temperatures. Now, I come from a place where we know about viscosity and low temperatures. In, in Wisconsin, yesterday, it was minus 16 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> yeah, you think it was chilly yesterday, huh? Um, and so we have to change the oil in our cars going into the winter so that uh, it doesn't gum up the engine. Well, it's sort of maybe a simple, similar idea here, that it's much harder, harder to push a fluid full of cells through capillaries. And so somehow these fish have dispensed with red blood cells altogether. Well, what would cause such an extreme change? Why on earth would these fish do that? Well, to appreciate that, to appreciate the, what's been going on in their habitat, we have, to under, we have to know what's been going on in that part of the world um, over geologic time. And we do know there's been some rather dramatic changes in that part of the world. About 40 million years ago, South America and Antarctica were joined. And about 33 to 34 million years ago, give or take a week, um, they separated. And that opened up a passage, Drake's passage. I don't think I have to tell you who Drake was. And um, that changed the pattern of currents around the continent of Antarctica. 
and the waters became much more isolated and much colder, such that while 40 million years ago, these waters were about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, today they're 29 to 30 degrees Fahrenheit. And there's a dramatic changeover in the fish fauna in these waters. So whereas we know from the fossil record that there were things like sharks and skates and flounders in these waters um, 30, 40 million years ago, those fish are not there now. And what you have, for example, are these 15 species of ice fish and about 120 species related to the ice fish in these waters that I'll tell you a little bit more about. And together, those fish make up about 90% of the biomass in, in the Southern Ocean. So clearly, the evolution of these species is somehow linked to this change in the habitat. Now, as evolutionary biologists, what we'd like to do is really understand the history of the ice fish. And usually, the place you would start to understand the origin of a group would be the fossil record. But we're out of luck. There is no fossil record for these fish. And even if we had a fossil record for these fish, it's improbable we'd be able to tell the color of their blood. So if we really want to understand how these fish adapted to the sub-freezing waters of Southern Ocean, where do we look? Where can we look for key clues? Well, while we don't have a fossil record, we do have a DNA record. And that DNA record is an incredibly information-rich document that allows us to decipher what was lost, what was gained, and what was modified in the course of evolution. So what I want to share with you is a couple of stories from the DNA record that give us a really clear picture of how these fish have changed in the course of their adaptation to the freezing waters of the Southern Ocean. Now, I'm going to start with a loss. Maybe not where you'd think I'd start, but it's going to make sense to you in a second with what I've told you about their blood. So if you look at the DNA of a red-blooded fish, you find that the genes that encode the molecule that carries oxygen, hemoglobin, the two chains of that molecule, are next to each other on a stretch of DNA. Just uh, shown here diagrammatically is this little candy stripe pattern and this green block. But if you look at the exact same place in the DNA of an ice fish, this gene is completely missing. And this gene is truncated and just a remnant of what existed, what exists in the other fish. And in fact, if you look at the code of this remnant, it's sort of eroding away, sort of losing its resemblance to the globin genes of other fish. So really, what we see here in the text of the DNA of the ice fish is a fossil. Much as a, ro much as a fossil weathers away and erodes when exposed to the elements, this gene, this last bit of text, is eroding away with time in the ice fish's genome, no longer functional, no longer contributing anything to the physiology and the lifestyle of this fish. So here's a clear signature in the DNA of this animal of how it's different. We know that its ancestors had red blood cells. All other fish have red blood cells. And this is a good hint that they've evolved from red-blooded ancestors and dispensed with those completely. So this is a case of losing genes they once had. And now that they've lost them, that's it. That red-blooded lifestyle nourished their ancestors for 500 million years. But now they've, ta they've taken a one-way ticket to a hemoglobin-free lifestyle. They don't carry oxygen by any active mechanism in their bloodstream. So this useless remnant, just a piece of, of a fossil, but an informative fossil because it tells us sort of something about their ancestors' lifestyle relative to today. Now, of course, evolution isn't all about losses. It's also about invention. And there's a really nifty invention that we can document in ice fish DNA. So I showed you the picture of these waters, and I'm sure you've seen film footage of the Antarctic. And it's an icy place, big icebergs, lots of chunks. If you look underwater, there's lots of ice particles and things like that. Well, that's a hazard to navigation for ice fish because their body, their bloodstream, and their tissues are, is full of water. And if that tissue comes in contact with ice, that ice crystal can grow. And you've got at least what, I don't know if you have fish sticks. Is that the word you use here in Britain? Yeah. You've got a fish stick, right? It's frozen solid. So somehow, living in this 29-degree water, this fish has to somehow avoid freezing up solid. And it has to worry about, for example, what would happen if it just happens while it's pursuing its food. It ingests a little ice particle. It doesn't want to form ice crystals from the inside out. So it's come up with a really nifty invention, antifreeze. So, and this is a picture of, a, of an ice fish relative. Ice fish and its closest relatives 
their bloodstream, their tissues, are chock full of a really peculiar family of proteins. And the job of these proteins is to suppress the temperature at which ice crystals can grow. And they suppress that temperature just to below the temperature, the, the, essentially the minimum temperature of the ocean. So this fish is living right on the edge, dropped by a couple tenths of a degree, and it's frozen. Okay? But it can survive in these waters where other fish cannot. So more temperate water fish would be long gone by this. They'd be frozen up solid. You get a, this ice fish gets about two degrees of protection um, from the presence of this antifreeze. Now, as I said, it's a very peculiar family of proteins, and it's clearly something invented um, in ice fish ancestors. And it's, as I said, there's chock full of this, really high concentrations in, in the bloodstream. But the really neat part of this story in terms of understanding something from the DNA record is that the same biologist who discovered this antifreeze, Art DeVries and his colleagues at the University of Illinois, this actually started 40 years ago, they were able to track the antifreeze genes in antifreeze-bearing fish. And they were actually, actually able to capture the evolution of an antifreeze gene. And what they found was is that the antifreeze gene evolved from a little piece of another gene, a gene that encoded a digestive enzyme. And they sort of caught it in the act of evolving because if you look in the DNA of certain fish, you can see the antifreeze gene right within that otherwise uh, digestive enzyme gene. So it's a very clear case of inventing something new using the code of another gene, an entirely novel function, antifreeze. But the basic unit of the antifreeze came from another gene. So you have a very clear forensic record of this biochemical invention. Why was it such an important invention? Well, about 135 species, ice fish and its relatives, um, carry antifreeze. And those fish, as I was telling you earlier, make up 90% of the biomass in this ocean. So this was a key invention that allowed it de allows these fish to invade this habitat and exploit its rich resources. Turns out these are very rich waters in terms of um, nutrients. And to, to uh, exploit these resources where other fish cannot. So it was a really key innovation to the radiation, the flowering of a whole new group of creatures. So what we learn from the DNA record and what I want to emphasize in the course of my talk are just three basic ideas. That the DNA record of the ice fish and of all species, some of which I'll tell you about shortly, really reflect how the earth and life evolved together. Those changes in the southern oceans put pressure on the populations in those oceans. They either migrated away to northern waters when extinct or adapted to the cold temperatures. And this is a story that goes on across the planet. Everywhere, organisms are just keeping up with the changing Earth. And the shifts in lifestyle of these organisms are reflected in the DNA of pertinent genes. What I mean by pertinent genes is the ice fish has about 20,000 genes. And the course of its evolution from a, a more warm water, red-blooded ancestor, some genes have changed, many genes have not. And the most profound changes we see make sense in terms of the adaptation to this lifestyle. And most importantly, especially right here, what this DNA record, an entirely independent record now, a rich record, and I'm going to tell you more stories about it, is a beautiful, vivid demonstration of Darwin's principles of natural selection. Now, just so we're all on the same page for the course of the talk, let's review in concise form what those principles are. And I've just taken one paragraph out of The Origin of Species that sums up the basic nub of the idea of natural selection and highlights the important points. So what Darwin said was, can it then be thought improbable that other variations useful in some way to each being in the great and complex battle of life? So of course, the revolution ushered in by Darwin was seeing nature as a great and complex battle not this harmoniously designed system with all of its parts sort of pre-configured by a, a manufacturer, but all of its parts in a struggle, a struggle for existence, a struggle for survival, a struggle for resources. I just sort of bold-faced the, the important ideas here that there are variations in, that arise in this great and complex battle over the course of thousands of generations. And of course, Darwin's other key advantage here was his geological training game, the sense of time that I think just other naturalists didn't have. Um, if such do, do occur, can we doubt, remembering that many more individuals are born than could possibly survive, that individuals having any advantage, however slight, over others, would have the best chance of surviving and of procreating their kind? On the other hand, and I think this is some part that's certainly forgotten in general about 
the principle of natural selection, is that we may feel sure that any variation in the least degree injurious would be rigidly destroyed. There's two sides of the coin. This preservation of favorable variations and the rejection of injurious variations I call natural selection. Now, we're going to look at these two sides of the coin. And what I want to emphasize, when you think about these ice fish, for example, is that things have happened to the ice fish that are good for them that would be bad for other species. And that this process of natural selection is, is very conditional. The fittest is a very conditional status. And this is what Darwin understood to a degree that some things would be bad and would need to be rejected, some injurious things. But what's injurious really depends upon the circumstances. So keep that in mind as I tell you some more stories. So this great and complex battle of life leaves a record in DNA. And that's what I really want to talk about for the rest of my lecture. And so what I want to show you in the remainder is I want to show you a few highlights and I think some profound surprises from this massive record of DNA. And when I mean massive, I can't exaggerate that. 20 years ago, when many of the biologists in this audience were manipulating DNA, if you took all of the DNA texts that biologists have ever deciphered and typed it out and put it in a book, it would fill just the average size novel. If you now took all the DNA texts that biologists have gathered, typed it out in those in texts, put it in books, and stacked those books, they'd be two miles high and growing at a phenomenal rate. So we have had an enormous influx of data. And a lot of biologists around the world are mining this DNA record for insights into the evolutionary process. So I'm going to tell you some stories about some more amazing creatures and some of the steps in evolution that we can now see in precise detail in the DNA record. And most of these stories you probably haven't heard before. I even include some of the professionals in the audience. Um, they're not in textbooks, but they well, they're mostly not in textbooks, but they, they will be soon. And then toward the end of my talk, I just want to spend a couple of minutes um, talking about the climate uh, back home um, regarding the acceptance of evolution, and maybe what this new DNA record means for, for that situation. So to illustrate this great battle of life and the DNA record that it leaves, I'm going to focus on just one aspect of this contest in nature. And that's the battle between seeing and not being seen. In the animal kingdom, this has been a perpetual battle for more than 500 million years. So we're going to talk about this evolutionary game of hide and seek. And to get you started, we're going to visit a battlefield. And the battlefield I want to tell you about is here. This is the Pinacate lava flow in southern Arizona. It also stretches into northern Mexico. And what you may be able to tell right away is that the color of this soil is pretty unusual. So while these beautiful saguaro cacti dot the landscape, they're growing out of very dark soil. And that soil is uh, made of a volcanic ash. And what's happened several times over the past million years in this part of the United States is there have been um, lava flows. And it's actually rather stunning. If you've been anywhere near the Grand Canyon, you can sort of just come around a curve, and all of a sudden there's a cinder cone and a big lava flow across it. It's, it's really stark. So um, this battlefield is pretty heterogeneous in terms of a habitat, because I'll show you one of these lava flows from another dimension. You can see that here's a craggy lava flow going right across the desert. And on either side of it is, is sort of this just scrubby desert, you know, sort of a rocky, sandy soil with little scrubby bushes. But this lava, of course, is, is, uh, is rich. As it breaks down, it's a rich source for plant material. And um, you can see some beautiful flowers and other sort of shrubbery starting to grow up. Um, on the lava flow. Now, the other parts in this habitat is just a desert, a rockscape of just sandy boulders. Now, this battlefield is home to the majestic, the magnificent, and I believe the soon-to-be iconic pocket mouse. <laughs> so the portraits I'm showing you here of these pocket mice given to me by my colleague Michael Nachman at the University of Arizona, who's worked on these for a number of years, um, illustrates an important principle about pocket mouse life. These mice come in two flavors, sandy and chocolate. And the reason I describe them as two flavors is, in fact, Michael has described them as the Snickers bars of the desert. Do you have Snickers here? Yeah, OK. All right. I was Yorkie bars of the desert. OK. Um, because they're, they're preyed upon by birds, by snakes, by lizards, et cetera. They're, they're quite abundant. They're an important part of the 
food chain in the desert. But they do come in these two flavors. So this is one species, comes in alternative, alternative colors. And you can see he's, he's um, taking pictures of them on, on different substrates. Here's a sandy mouse on sandy rock and a dark mouse on dark rock and then on the opposite. Well, this color matching matters because naturalists have been studying these mice for 80 years. I just want to point that out to the young people in the audience. This is what naturalists do. Um, and um, we know a lot about their behavior. We know a lot about their distribution. We know a lot about their predators. And the reason why this color matching is important is just think. You're one of these two mice sitting out on a, on a sandy rock, and you're dark, and you don't match. <laughs> you're dinner. But change the background, and you're a sandy mouse that's hopped up on one of these lava flows, and it works the other way around. So if you go to the southern desert, and I've been there, 99% of the mice out in the sandy desert are sandy colored. And 99% of the mice you'll find on the lava rock are dark colored. But they don't know the difference between each other. There's no behavioral difference. But the predators are, are pruning the populations to give you that distribution. The predators are doing their job and essentially sifting away all the mismatched mice on the, on the respective substrates. So this is clearly a case of natural selection based on color matching. And the reason I bring up the pocket mouse story, not only because it's such a clear illustration of that principle, but it's because we know a little more about these pocket mice. We know exactly what genetic mutation has happened in these mice that allowed that dark form to evolve and to invade the rock flow, the lava flows. So we know the ancestral color of these mice is sandy, and the new habitat, the change in Earth, remember Earth and life evolved together, the change in Earth is that these lava flows have come across the desert flow, uh, desert floor, and to invade this new habitat required some adaptation. That ad adaptation was in their fur color. And we know precisely what gene and what changes in that gene are responsible for the evolution of dark color. So in sandy pinnacotti mice, they have two copies of a gene, and this is one of the few gene names I'm going to give you tonight. It's called MC1R. And uh, they have two copies of a, of a gene. There are two alternative forms of this gene. And we have two copies of the light form. The mice are light. And if they have one or two copies of the alternative form, the so-called dark form that contains two mutations, they're dark. OK, so just keep MC1R in mind for later. OK. So here's a story. I think it's pretty straightforward to understand, but it's where we've got it. We've zipped it all up. We know the agent of selection. We know the basis of genetic variation. We know what's going on in the habitat. This is natural selection understood in full. So just to give you an appreciation of this evolutionary game of hide and seek, I'm going to now describe a case where the seeker has come up with a trick. Now, it also involves rodents, maybe a rodent you've seen. This is the field vole found here in northern Europe. This is not shown to scale. This is more of a Monty Python-sized field vole. Um, if I hid him in a, to scale in a nice green field, you wouldn't be able to see him. And that's the point. This vole is the favorite supper of this bird, the European kestrel. And so the story I want to tell you about is how does the kestrel find his lunch? Now, to tell you about that, now just think about this bird. Now, it's flying, this majestic bird flying over this green field. How does it pick out a little vole among that tall green grass? Well, it's come up with a trick. And to appreciate the trick that it's come up with, I have to tell you a little bit about the vision of this kestrel. This kestrel has what we call full color vision. From a human perspective, what we mean by full color vision is that we can see across the rainbow, and that is uh, due to our detection of various wavelengths of light by proteins in our retina. Now, these proteins are called opsins, and we have three of them involved in color vision. Three opsins encoded by three genes confer what we call full color vision. And it's the integration of um, the information from these three opsins that gives us the, the color image that we have. There's a fourth opsin I'm not going to bring up any, that's used for dim light vision. It's not part of my story tonight. So we have these three color opsins. And when I say we, that means humans and great apes and old world monkeys, but no other mammals. So if you've ever wondered what your dog or cat or guinea pig sees, they see less than you do because they don't have full color vision. They don't have three color detecting opsins. We know that somewhere in our ape and old world uh, primate ancestry, the third gene was invented and fine-tuned to give this, this full sensitivity to this, the spectrum of sunlight here from roughly the violet to the deep red. 
Well, birds also have full color vision. They detect the colors quite well. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about first, before I go into the bird side of this, why might color vision been at all significant in our history? And there's various uh, biologists who've worked on this. But the best way I can illustrate this to you is to show you a little clip. Uh, it's about an eight second long clip of a monkey, a red colobus monkey on the island of Zanzibar. The internet is a wonderful thing. I, I, this is not my footage. And what I want you to pay attention to, I'll show you the clip twice. What I want you to pay attention to is what the monkey decides to eat and what the monkey decides not to eat. So here's this red colobus monkey in the canopy, all those green leaves. But did you see what he grabbed and ate? Maybe you could see it down front. Watch one more time. I don't know if we need to dim the lights a little bit. Can everybody see this OK? OK, well, thank you. All right, so there he is. He's ignoring all the green leaves. And he reaches for, can you see those leaves? Yellow and red. Now, without full color vision, he could not distinguish those red leaves from the green leaves. Why is that important? You can bring the lights up again. The reason why it's important is that those yellow and red leaves are younger, more nutritious, tender, easier to digest. In fact, those green leaves can be toxic. So all these old world monkeys and great apes have this capability. And it works for fruits, too. So they can tell the difference between green fruit and red fruit. This has been well studied in the wild by various um, primate biologists. So we think it was pretty important that we could graze through the um, forest more effectively than other mammals or than other primates that didn't have. When I say we, I mean that ancestry that Darwin taught us about. Um, our primate ancestors could graze through the forest more effectively because we could distinguish these colors of, of fruits and leaves, giving us an advantage. OK, now remember, you know, half an hour ago, I was telling you about a kestrel. OK, back to the kestrel. So now you have a little feel for color vision. What's going on with a kestrel? Well, the kestrel has had a mutation. In one of its opsins, the opsin involved in detecting light at the violet end of the rainbow, there's a single mutation in the opsin's code, a single letter, that has shifted the sensitivity of that opsin such that it does not, is not stimulated by violet light, but in the ultraviolet. Now, in you and I, this would be very bad. This would completely change our perception of the world around us. But in the kestrel, it's OK. In fact, all kestrels, all European kestrels have this mutation. I'm seeing in the ultraviolet, why would they have this mutation? Well, it makes sense when you understand that vol urine reflects in the ultraviolet. <laughs> Once again, the majesty of natural history. I'm just going to preempt a question that may come up at the reception. I have no idea how they get the voles to go in the cups. <laughs> so these voles, now we know what the kestrel's up to. These voles, these uh, voles are signaling each other. And the kestrel's kind of honing in on, on the vole scent channels by seeing this reflection with its ultraviolet vision. And so what the kestrel is doing is it's scanning for vole trails. Wherever voles have made a path around their burrows, et cetera, there's going to be, of course, um, more markings. And all they have to do is instead of looking at the whole green field and being bewildered, they just zero in on where they see that ultraviolet signal and look for a moving vole. Snap. So the point I want to emphasize from these two stories about hide and seek is that and I think this highlights maybe one of the major misconceptions about uh, the evolutionary process. There's, there's this random component in evolution. It often gets people a little bit bewildered. If, if evolution is random, how could there be such order in nature? Well, no, the random component is mutation. Every individual that's born carries new mutations that are distributed at random throughout its genome. And sometimes a mutation arises, for example, in an opsin gene. And sometimes a mutation arises in an MC1R gene. It's the habitat and predators and mates that decide who the winners and losers are among those variants, that sort that out, that determine which variants are favored, which are rejected, which are the fittest. So what was good for the kestrel could be very bad for other birds. What was good for a population of pocket mice living on the lava 
could be very bad for other mice living out in the desert. So a mutation sort of has that negative connotation, but whether a mutation is good or bad dep depends entirely on the circumstances in which organisms live. Now you might think that once you've invented something as wonderful as color vision, never get rid of it. Think again. So I'm going to dispatch that notion by telling you about some other creatures. I'm going to stay with this theme of talking about vision and seeing, but I'm going to switch groups of animals, some pretty, pretty creatures, and talk about fish. Those of you who are hobbyists might like tropical fish, or those of you who like to scuba or snorkel or uh, visit aquaria, you know that reef fish are often brightly colored. Well, they live in shallow water. And in shallow water, all the wavelengths of light reach that, uh, that shallow water, and so you can see all the colors of the rainbow in these fish. But at greater depths, something else is going on. And to give you a, a sense of what's going on at greater depths, I'm going to show you a little clip of a fish. And uh, well, gee, I, I mean, this isn't going to be a mystery in Cambridge. Um, but anyone who wants to identify that fish, this fish, can just shout it out as soon as they understand, as soon as they recognize it. It's a famous fish. There we go. OK. Um, so the coelacanth uh, is famous in natural history, but both because of its important place in evolution, but it was, this belongs to a group of fish that was thought to be extinct um, for the last 65 million years. It was rediscovered in, in 1938 and uh, plays an important uh, part of our, our, our lore in natural history. And ju I just also just like watching it swim. <laughs> um, but what's important about the coelacanth is it lives um, it essentially hangs out in, in caves during the day on, on the, on the uh, seabed and goes out at night prowling for its food. So it lives in a very dim light, if not dark, habitat. Well, why, that, why is that helpful to know? Because if we look at its genes, there's a very clear signature of this difference in lifestyle. So if we look at something like a clownfish living in shallow water that, where all wavelengths of sunlight reach, um, and we look at something like the violet opsin gene of the clownfish. I'm just showing you this schematically. It's perfectly intact and functioning and contributing to the sense of color vision of the clownfish. But if we look at that very same gene in a coelacanth, it's shot to pieces. There are four different mutations in it, each one of which would totally blow away the function of the coelacanth violet opsin gene. Well, how can we rationalize that? Well, it's living in deep water. Only dim blue light is reaching this animal. There's no possibility of full color vision. Wavelengths of light aren't there. So these mutations don't affect the coelacanth's vision. They don't affect its performance whatsoever. What's going on? Well, what you have to appreciate is that in clownfish, there are clownfish born all the time that have mutations in the violet opsin gene that would disrupt it. But they don't do well. So when we go into nature, we don't see clownfish with disrupted opsin genes. Those are poor performers. They're rejected by this process of natural selection. They're not going to do well on the reef. But when those mutations arise in coelacanth babies, it doesn't matter. It doesn't compromise its function whatsoever. So over time, mutations just pile up in this gene, making it a molecular fossil. So here's another case where we can recognize this as an opsin gene. There's enough of the text there intact. We can tell it used to be an opsin gene. But it's been hit many times by inactivating mutations. How do we rationalize this? That Sometime in coelacanth ancestors may have had color vision. They had, an op they had an intact violet opsin gene. But as these fish have shifted to a deep water lifestyle, it's relaxed selection on the opsin. Natural selection is blind to those mutations. They're neither advantageous nor injurious. So they just accumulate. Now you might say, OK, fossil genes. Where, where is he heading at? He's told me about fossil genes in ice fish and coelacanths. It's Friday night. Couldn't I be doing something better? Is this just something that goes on in really weird creatures or just you know, strange fish that live in strange habitats? No. And I want to tell you a, few, a little bit more about fossil genes and maybe a little more familiar and cuddly creatures so you get the major point. So I've told you about animals living in, in deep water and dim habitats. What, what might we find if we looked around the world in other habitats that are different? Let's say, for example, that animals that are strictly nocturnal, cuddly animals like this owl monkey with big, beautiful eyes. OK. But if you look at its violet opsin gene, it's a molecular fossil. It's there. We can see that it's there. But it's been mutated several times. Those mutations are different than what we see in the coelacanths. So this has happened completely independently in history. But nonetheless, 
this animal, which is strictly nocturnal, is no longer using its violet opsin gene. Ancestors had it. It's gone. I mean, it's, it's there, but inactivated in this owl monkey. Hmm. Well, is this one example? I'll give you another one. Cute little bush baby. Different part of the primate tree. Same story. Look at its opsin gene. It's inactivated. It's still there, but inactivated by a bunch of mutations. Different set of mutations than we see in the owl monkey or in the coelacanth. Same thing. So the evolution of the nocturnal lifestyle is accompanied by the inactivation of this opsin gene. Now, I'm really going to test your fondness for mammals with this next one. So we've looked at deep water, and we've looked at nocturnal behavior. What happens when they go underground? <laughs> Every now and then when I'm in front of a biological audience, I can hear a little awe in the audience. And that, that's when I really know that the hardcore is here. But anyway. Um, <laughs> Here's a subterranean blind mole rat, has the most reduced eyes of any mammal. And if you look at its violet opsin gene, same story. Inactivated, different set of mutations than what you see in the bush baby or the owl monkey um, or the coelacanth. So what's the story? This is still, are these still creatures too weird for you? Fossil genes, kind of too strange a concept? Well, let's go to the weirdest animal of all, us. You look inside our genome, and this number changes a little bit. Maybe it's closer to 20,000 genes. Now that we've been figuring out how to count them. But what we know is that in the human genome, we're carrying around 887 fossil genes, broken genes that were used sometime in the past. In fact, 67 of those genes are fossilized specifically in the human lineage. These are genes that are still working in chimpanzees, our closest living relative, but no longer working in humans. So this is an ongoing process. As organisms evolve, as they change lifestyles from their ancestors, some old genes no longer contribute to their fitness, no longer matter in terms of their performance, their reproduction, et cetera. And we look in their DNA, we can see that piece of text there, but these are just broken pieces of yesterday's lifestyle still residing in their DNA. So they tell us a lot about their ancestors. They give us a sense of just how dynamic this process of evolution is with old genetic information being discarded, and as I told you, with things like antifreeze, new genetic information being invented. So what do we learn from fossil genes? Well, as I said, it tells us about lifestyles of ancestors. But more important in terms of Darwin's ideas, this is exactly what we should expect to see happen in the absence of natural selection. Use it or lose it would be the motto. As conditions change, as species in, uh, uh, adapt to different habitats, some of those genes just don't matter anymore. And as they get mutated, natural selection is blind to them. It also demonstrates, shatters any notion that evolution is a progressive process, at least as far as genetic information is concerned. Some information gets irretrievably lost. Globin genes are gone from ice fish. Violet opsin genes are gone from the organisms I told you about. Hundreds of smell receptor genes are gone from you and I. OK, so one of the big groups of fossilized genes in, in us is our sense of smell. I think they also tell us something that diversity, again, is, is not a matter of design. I, I would just pose the quasi-rhetorical question, you know, what, what designer designs non-functional genes? Uh, I'd say a designer with a heck of a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> There's something else I, that that story about the fossils genes is, is, I think, leading us to. It's telling you about the same gene being inactivated in all these different species, living in all these different parts of the world, again and again and again. And what was the common link for the violet opsin gene, a, a dim habitat? Well, it raises this question, is, is evolution maybe a little more reproducible, right? a little more predictable than we thought? I'll, I'll bet, I don't know, what, two pounds, I think, in my pocket. I'll bet, go look at other nocturnal animals, you're going to find some of these same things. And as we mine the DNA record of Species, we're seeing that. There are some species that have thousands of fossil genes they're carrying around. But again, it makes sense in terms of understanding how their lifestyles have shifted. But this repetition, the same thing happening in different places. Do we see this going on with any other, any other genes? Again, in this day and age, where we have such easy access to the DNA record, the answer is yes. So remember the gene I told you about in the pocket mice? Well, here's a beautiful study done by Nick Mundy here at Cambridge, that, his group, 
sorry, the whole group that uh, works with Nick Mundy, uh, where they found that, again, it's mutations in this MC1R gene that account for the differences in the beautiful plumage patterns of uh, white and the melanic forms of the lesser snow goose. Same thing, changes in this MC1R gene are also responsible for the differences between the orange phase and the dark phase in jaguars. Nick Mundy's group has also shown that the difference in coloration between the uh, melanic and the light forms of the Arctic skua are also due to differences in MC1R, and most striking, they're due to the exact same mutation, the exact same letter of the DNA code that happened in pocket mice. So obviously these are birds living in a totally different part of the world from those pocket mice. So yeah, evolution does repeat itself, sometimes in exact, precise detail. And if you crunch the numbers, this is easily understandable. There are so many offspring born per unit time that we know the same mutations are happening again and again and again on the planet, both in the same species and in different species all across the world. And if you want to see those numbers crunched, that'll cost you about 20 pounds, I think. It's, uh, it's in the making of the fittest. Okay. So I'm not going to put you through the math today. So I want to give you one more example. Remember ice fish antifreeze? Well, that's the Southern Ocean. What about the fish living at the other pole? up by the Arctic. Do they have antifreeze? How do they get by? Yep, they have antifreeze. Now you could think that antifreeze might have evolved in a couple different ways or might have gotten there in a couple different ways. Maybe some fish swam from the Southern Ocean to the Arctic or maybe they came up with the exact same antifreeze but the story's even better than that. They came up with biochemically extremely similar antifreezes. But we know from the forensic record in DNA, they were in, it, invented completely independently by using different pieces of DNA code. So they came up with the same solution, virtually the same molecular solution to the same problem, preventing their uh, blood from freezing. And we know this happened about 10 million years apart at opposite poles in the globe. So these examples of evolution repeating itself, and there are many, many, many more, prompt us to think that, yeah, maybe Evolution does repeat itself, and why would that be? Well, similar selective conditions, cold water, dark habitat, or color matching on habitats, they favor similar genetic variations in different species at different times in different parts of the world. And so, yeah, evolution is far more reproducible and more predictable than we thought. You would have never guessed this without looking at the DNA record. Species just look too different to us to imagine the exact same things are taking place, but they are. So from these examples, from this massive DNA record, growing all the time, I'd argue I, I think we're in a second golden age of evolutionary biology. Well, then what was the first golden age? That was Darwin, Wallace, and Bates in the tropics. That's what I would say when there was so much to be discovered. And now, instead of sort of collecting species and putting them in the museum, we're collecting species and sequencing their DNA and putting it on the internet, where people can make discoveries with just a browser. And I think this enthusiasm, this understanding of the power of evolutionary biology having increased is, is out in the, in the public view. This is a cover from Time Magazine a, a bit a while ago, but we know now, you know, we have full human genome, chimpanzee genome, macaque genome, gorilla genome, soon complete Neanderthal genome, something that's barely our cousin genetically. So it's a golden age. It's the best time to be an evolutionary biologist since maybe 1860. So while we're in a golden age in evolutionary biology, I, I would be just a little bit remiss not to acknowledge that some folks are still in the dark age. You may not know this fellow. He's sort of notorious back home. And it makes, I've been carrying this slide for a while and it delights me to be able to update this. This is slightly out of date. <laughs> Happens to the best of them. So this is some of the pronouncements that we get to hear from the highest levels of government. 
which is a bit disconcerting. Um, I, I collect these, partly for your entertainment. Yes, I'm sure you wonder what is going on on the other side of the ocean. Um, here's another one. I was in Tennessee a little while ago, and I, I found this one from a Tennessee state senator. We've hunted for almost 150 years and not found supporting evidence. <laughs> Who's we? <laughs> well, the we, turns out, I never heard of him, State Senator Raymond Finney. Time for Google Image, right? <sighs> this explains it all. <laughs> so I know you're aware of all this, but what are these people, what are these politicians and various proponents that can't see evolution wherever they look, can't see a single example? I almost invited to my classroom. Um, what do they want? Well, they want an alternative explanation to Darwinian evolution. Yes, in this day and age, in 2009, after all the geologic record, fossil record, DNA record, they want an alternative. How would that go? What would a lesson be? What would it look like, say, for the story I told you about the Kestrel? I don't think I have to even address the science here. This is, there's theological issues right here. I'm not a theologian, but I would at least argue, one, God, she, she has better things to do. <laughs> Two, I don't think God would have anything particularly against voles. So there's a big disconnect, obviously, where the science is and where the, the public acceptance is. And you know, what, what can you say to these people? Well, you know. Mutation, not miracles, mutations. Now, I have to confess, I have witnessed miracles. I'm not done, don't worry. We're still rolling, relax. I'm just getting a drink of water. Uh, don't worry, just a couple more things to say. So, what thought do I want to leave you with <laughs> Bef before I'm kicked out? Well, there's a silver lining in this controversy you hear about from your silly adolescent children across the, the Atlantic. And the silver lining in the recent storm over evolution is that really evolution is being talked about more now than at any other time in my career. Many, many, many people, educators, scientists, and yes, even politicians, are motivated to right the ship. And I think the vehemence of the opposition is more a sign of how strong the evidence is, and they know it. And as I've shown tonight, it's only getting better. So I often think, if Darwin was here today, what would he say? He faced this kind of opposition. <clears throat> well, I think I ought to start with a th thanks to Nick Parks, because I've <laughs> no doubt at all that Wallace and Gromit would have relished being in a story that in, in, had its other characters, ice fish, pocket mice, mole rats, and vole pea. You can see it next Christmas, can't you? Well, it was an absolutely fascinating account of uh, what I suppose is sort of biological archaeology, the extraordinary way in which the living DNA can be excavated to reveal the history of evolution of the animal from which it comes. And that what's, what once fitted its predecessors to a particular environment uh, becomes redundant and erodes because it ceases to provide the the best, the best fit. And what a wonderful start to this series. And I'm sure no higher tribute to the creativity of Charles Darwin than the extraordinary way in which science has grown from the seeds that he planted. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you.